okay, <clears throat> so I, I begin with a, with, a, with a German architect. Well, she was part German too, but she was part German, part Dutch. But uh, Dominikus Zimmermann was uh, from Bavaria and uh, that's where he lived and there he worked together with his brother. Uh, so he, he died on, uh, on November uh, uh, 16th. And so a few words about him. So he was born in uh, Gaze Point near Vesselbrunn in, in 1685 and became a Baumeister, meaning an architect and the Stacco East. His older brother, Johann, Johannes Baptist Zimmermann was an architect and the Fresco East. <laughs> anyway, working together, they produced masterpieces such as the Church of Steinhausen Dominikus Zimmermann descended from a family of artists and craftsmen belonging to the so-called Vessel Brunner School, worked first as a stucco East and later as a master builder and architect. He lived in Landsberg am Lech, where he was mayor between 1748 and 1753. He died near the Pilgrim's Church in, uh, I don't know very well how to pronounce this short uh, word, I don't know German to my shame, this, this, near Steingarten in, uh, in 1766. I had uh, some problems with him because he, the churches he built are, are, are so similar that uh, I, I got very confused. And even the name of the, of the, of the city uh, is very similar. He built in two cities, two different churches, and the names of the cities are very, very close to each other. And, and the looks of the, of the churches as well. But this is the handsome um, Dominicus um, uh, Zimmermann. And um, you see there are interesting people that we never learned about in school. He was a very uh, accomplished um, Rococo architect and the interiors of his churches are truly uh, uh, remarkable, maybe a little more than, uh, than the exterior. This was the first work that I found that he built, but I couldn't find pictures with it. So we'll go to the next one, the old town hall and the church. I only found pictures of the old town in Landsberg am Lech. And so from 1719, so he was uh, 15, 34 years old when he built this uh, old town hall, which is still uh, standing. And this is it. And, uh, you know, uh, out of a flat uh, facade, he was able to make a, a building that uh, stands out. Why? Because of the bidimensional art, because of the, of the pictorial art, you know, the decorative art, which, which uh, made the building stand out. Of course, it's not just the, the, the painting, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, ornamentation did have a role and uh, I, I think our our buildings today uh, are deprived of this luxury uh, most of the time to to work uh, in in a more sensitive way uh, you employing uh, ornaments because as you know the ornament was banished from our, uh, modern architecture and uh, it wasn't just Adolf Loss who wrote, uh, you know, almost violently against it. Although Adolf Loos, as you know, uh, he employed ornaments himself, not directly, not explicitly, but he used very um, uh, rich uh, in, in texture and, and uh, decoration, uh, organic natural materials like marble. And, uh, and so did Miss van der Rohe in the Barcelona pavilion you know, which appears to be so simple and so on. Well, he uses very expensive materials and, uh, and uh, with a very obvious uh, ornamentation, you know, stones with, with a very rich uh, uh, decorative uh, pattern. But in this case, uh, you know, the ornament was, uh, was uh, you know, part of the, the aesthetics of the time and uh, I think the ornament is coming back now with, with great strength. And, uh, still, uh, 
you know, in some more orthodox schools of architecture is not talked about, but um, some of the most interesting architects today work with the ornament. Not in this way, in other ways. After all, even the works of, uh, you know, parametrics or let's say some, some works by Zaha Hadid are rather ornamental in nature, but a different kind of ornament, an ornament that became structure and the structure became ornament. And the whole building is an ornament in a certain way, in, in three dimensions. But at that time, but you see, if you compare the buildings on the left with the buildings on the right, meaning the building in the center, which is the city hall, it stands out. And not only because it is taller, but, you know, because mainly of its ornamentation. Otherwise, I mean, if you would have ornated the buildings on the left and the right in a similar way, you would have said that maybe the same architect built all of them. Um, you know, the, the, the tension between uh, structure and ornament uh, is a real one, but they need each other. And uh, it, I, I put it in this way, maybe a little bit um, simplistically, but I think a building that which has only structure and it has no ornament is like a tree only with the trunk and the branches, but no foliage and no flowers in the spring. And that would be a rather, you know, almost depressing tree. But we are still obsessed by structure in the schools of architecture here. Everybody talks about the structure, the structure, the structure, but no one even mentions the word ornament. And you need both structure and ornament, even, uh, um, uh, you know, from the, the studio of Zaha Hadid, uh, Patrick Schumacher, uh, in a presentation he made uh, recently, he stated clearly, structure and ornament should come together. But, uh, you know, orthodox modernism is still uh, reluctant to accept this, unfortunately. Anyway, um, but these, these ornaments do add richness to the, to, the, to the building. Even a flat facade, a flat wall becomes richer because of ornamentation. On the other hand, I understand why modernism fought against the ornament, because it was tired of the eclecticisms of the 19th century, because it was, uh, you know, especially after the first World War, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a quest for uh, a fresh new beginning, for more honesty, for uh, a new society, because the, the, the fight against the ornament also meant envisioning some kind of a new society, less prone to the, the influences of the past, meaning the 19th century, the imperial culture, and so on. But it is coming back, and uh, I think uh, it is a normal phenomenon that, uh, for example, in a few days, I will talk about a very interesting, but very provocative and very sometimes even disgusting, uh, if I'm allowed to say such an, uh, to use such a non-academic word, uh, architect from the United States who teaches at Yale University. He's uh, still rather young, uh, Mark Foster Gage, who employs ornament in an unbelievable ways. So it will be his birthday uh, in this month, in November, and I invite you, if you want, uh, to a presentation about him, just to show you how powerfully uh, the ornament is coming back to architecture. And I'm talking about a young architect, approximately young, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, teaching in a very important school, so, uh, yeah, Mark Foster Gage, G-A-G-E. Okay, now we see uh, this, with this, with, this, uh, <laughs> with this church I had troubles because you see it's, it's Steinhausen, but then it's shoes and read, you know, it's, I'm not saying that the words are identical, they are not, but you know, they are, <laughs> They almost have the same number of letters and they both begin with S. So I got a little bit confused. 
And also, I think I'm not the only one who got confused because the, the images of the inside are so similar that I didn't know any longer uh, which interior belonged to which of the two churches. Uh, it's plus, you know, the, the work is so covered with ornaments that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to understand if you are in a hurry, if you are in this building or that building. Apparently he built and uh, decorated these buildings together with his brother, who was also, uh, uh, he was an architect and uh, uh, fresco East, meaning he did frescoes, while uh, Dominicus um, um, uh, Zimmermann was doing stucco and uh, was also a builder. Interesting people, but, um, um, and, and you see the el ellipse, of course, the ellipse is unavoidable when you talk about the Baroque and uh, the Rococo and so on. You know, it's, the, it's a reaction to classicism. It's a reaction to the perfection of the, of the circle. As you know, the ellipse is, is, uh, is, is built, is, uh, is the result of, of using two circles, so two centers. So it's, you know, the ellipse is uh, a little bit uh, scandalous for, uh, you know, the, the, the need for certitude, which, uh, for example, the circle is so uh, plainly uh, and, and, and powerfully uh, satisfying. But uh, the, the Baroque mentality needed instability and uh, as such the ellipse was uh, better suited. Uh, I actually admire even, I always abhorred Rococo art or architecture because I thought it was too heavy and too, in a way, too syrup-like uh, uh, and too lascivious and too, I, I don't know, too, uh, too heavy, yes, like a heavy birthday cake. Uh, but, but I began to change a little bit because I think uh, I, I even made a presentation on, uh, I called it um, Watteau's architecture. Um, Watteau was a, a great uh, Rococo French painter. In, in certain cases, the Watteau aesthetics or the, the, the Rococo aesthetics were actually uh, promoting uh, musicality. You know, it was about uh, the music of, uh, of uh, aesthetics, you know, to light, uh, airy, uh, flying. So gravity was, was, um, was challenged through uh, this, uh, you know, light flamboyance of, of forms. Uh, it remains to be seen, you know, it, it, it's also in a way the femi feminization of architecture, but it's just like a tree in flowers and with, with leaves in the spring it, 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 the, the, the Baroque and the Rococo art is, is blooming and being so is, uh, you know, uh, an, uh, an assertion of life and of a certain form of sensitivity. The exterior of the church is, uh, is though uh, the less, uh, less uh, ornamented. And uh, again, I, 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 I continue to be confused because there are two, ch uh, two ch churches that are very similar and I still don't know which one is which and where it is situated. Um, anyway, uh, they, uh, they are very similar, uh, both inter the, the interior and the exterior. But I do think ro Rococo art uh, and Rococo architecture could could be uh, uh, maybe even more than acceptable if, if we get rid of the dogmatic understanding of what is good in, in architecture that we learn through the prisms and dogmas of modern orthodox architecture. But even uh, Roco the Rococo mentality is coming back because of the new technologies we have, be because of the softwares, because of Maya, because of uh, scripting and programming, parametrics and so on. So it's all about fluidities. You know, uh, uh, Zaha Hadid, for example, uh, published two books 
total fluidity and fluid totalities with the work of her students in Vienna, uh, you know, covering about 20 years of, she, she ran a studio at the Institute of Architecture in Vienna. Anyway, uh, but we are now in the 17th, uh, 18th century um, uh, with Mr. Dominicus um, uh, Zimmermann. And, uh, you know, this is the work of his brother, I, I, I guess. Uh, he was the fresco East. Uh, I guess they worked well together. Anyway, this is another church, Church of Our Lady in Günzburg uh, from 1735 and 1740. Um, so when they built this church, uh, Piranesi was, uh, when they started to build this church, Piranesi was uh, uh, 15 years old. He was born in 1720, exactly 30, uh, 300 years ago. I mentioned Pier Piranesi because uh, it, it, you know it's it's an important year for for in relation with him and also yesterday I, I meant to talk about him and I didn't <laughs> now I feel I feel guilty anyway um, so you know towards the outside uh, maybe the shape of the windows um, has some reference to you know, what we call Baroque and what we might call also Rococo, but otherwise the walls are not very adorned. But the, but the windows are, uh, you know, whimsical and uh, I think, uh, why not, you know, why should the windows be just, uh, you know, rectangles or squares, why? Um, Lina Bobardi, uh, and it will be her birthday in December, on the 5th of December, and I, I can't wait to make a presentation about her. She used even irregular, um, irregular kind of windows, and uh, none was repeating uh, the shape of another one. You will see, uh, you will see that. Anyway, maybe Frank Lloyd Wright was right that um, it would be easy to do architecture if if you didn't have to create windows or to put windows in the walls. Yeah, the window could be uh, problematic in the sense, you know, how do you do it convincingly so it doesn't look capricious. But look at these windows here, you know. Uh, so they are really formal gestures, you know, uh, and uh, why not? The interior, yes, is is um, is, is musical, is is rococo, but I don't think it's a is a tiring uh, interior. At least uh, you know from what I see in this picture, and I regret it's not in colors. Um, so you see, even if the the theorist or the theoretician is trying to convince us that certain forms of art or architecture are not viable any longer, I'm not convinced about it because, uh, you know, there are, I think, uh, constants of the human spirit and it doesn't matter you are in the 18th century or in the 21st century, certain uh, dispositions of the human soul or, or the human mentality or the human mind um, are kind of repeating themselves on the spiral of time. Certain art uh, is more austere, another art is more sensuous. So uh, I think we could, we could perhaps talk even about uh, present day Rococo uh, architecture and art. Now this is the church <laughs> You see Steingarten, it's, it's very similar, the, the name of, with, with the other one, and they even look alike, and I, I'm even afraid now that it's actually, I'm showing you the same building. And it was built, you know, 10 years later or something like this. Uh, I actually think this one is, is, is the first one, but I couldn't find, I don't know, I'm still confused. And I think the, the information on, on, on the web is also very, um, uh, puzzling. Um, anyway, um, is this the same church or not? Somehow I have a feeling in the previous church I didn't see something like this. So it might be that this is a little bit different. Anyway, 
they built two churches. Well, they built three churches, uh, but um, they're very similar. Anyway, uh, the interior is uh, as it is in the previous one. Uh, sorry for the resolution of the of the pictures. Um, but you see how how important, how powerful the the bidimensional intervention is. You know, if you try to make abstraction of it, you get a very different building. Although the physicality of the building remains absolutely the same. So, you know, the pictorial arts, frescoes, or whatever they are, they do have. The, the capacity to, to amplify certain things and to uh, dilute other things uh, in terms of meaning as well. You know, this, this uh, ability to destabilize architecture through the pictorial art is real. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it is a form of doing architecture that is not very common these days, but um, I think uh, employing again the, 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 the talent of, uh, of the plastic artists of whatever they are, sculptors or painters would, would, uh, would uh, create richer, richer environments. And uh, yeah, um, perhaps we should do it again. Uh, and they need us and we need them. Again, without uh, the, the, the pictorial art, what would this building be like? You know, it would be a little different, if not sig significantly different. Of course, the, the minimalist would protest. The minimalist would say, wait a minute, I can't take this. But not everybody has the, the disposition, the, you know, the taste of a minimalist. And why should minimalist be the only aesthetics? Uh, you know, uh, it shouldn't. You know, uh, once I wrote a little kind of a poem, very little, and I will uh, recite it for you. Uh, many times, less is less. A few times, less is more. Many times, more is less. A few times, more is more. Well, I guess what I wanted to say is that, you know, we have many buildings where less is actually less. And only in the case of a few architects like, let's say, Miss van der Rohe or John Poulsen, and there are a few others where, where, the, where the less becomes more because of the, the abilities of the, of the architect. On the other hand, there are many buildings where more is less. But there are a few, those of the talented Baroque or Rococo architects or the Manneries, where, where more is actually more. So it all depends uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the, the abilities of the creator and uh, you know, the specific conditions of the work uh, at hand. You know, today I looked through a magazine, the Japan architect that I have in the house and uh, I, I discovered actually, I looked through that magazine before, but I discovered some very important works by Tadao Ando, for example, and they seem to me actually to be poor. I mean, you know, I don't think his architecture is so, uh, I mean, he, he, he also it depends how it is presented, but this is a serious magazine, the Japan architect, and it, you know, Tadao Ando is Japanese, so he was presented properly. But somehow, you know, all those concrete walls, you know, never ending, always there, you know, yes, sometimes he's able with light to create um, beneficial uh, situations. But, you know, 
I'm, I'm surprised. How come he didn't get tired of it, you know, of this? I mean, if you look at this building, okay, you might say it's too much, you know, it's just too much, it is excessive. But just to, just to put this building near, just what you see here, this image, with an image of, uh, let's say, a building by Tadao Ando. Would you really say that the one by Tadao Ando is uh, undisputably much better? Why? Here there is, uh, you know, a different form of architecture, different form of aesthetics, but I wouldn't call it, you know, less or inferior. It's, it's a very different sensibility, but uh, I, I, I don't know. I think we need also richness. Anyway, um, we can talk about it about some other time, maybe to compare minimalism with uh, Baroque or with, uh, I don't know, even Rococo. Well, I, I kept saying, I, I kept asking myself, you know, about the evaluations in the architecture school. The professors are so at ease to give grades very scientifically, very precisely. I couldn't do it. For example, if you had the evaluators, if you had a minimalist and a Baroque, uh, or if you had, let's say, uh, Gaudi and Miss van der Rohe. Now, Miss would choose works probably that are kind of similar to, to his uh, aesthetics, and Gaudi would do the same. But you wouldn't say that one was right and the other one was wrong. The minimalist would not choose, you know, the, the, you know, the aesthetics promoted by, by, uh, by Gaudi and, and vice versa. I actually saw uh, uh, the work submitted to a competition in Japan where the, the evaluators, the judges, were Jean Nouvel and Tadao Ando. And there were several hundreds of works, many works, and some very interesting. But what was very interesting is that Jean Nouvel chose 10 projects and uh, Tadao Ando chose 10 projects, but they didn't choose not even one single project, project together the same project. And you, you cannot, we cannot accuse Tadao Ando or, or Jean Nouvel of being unserious or capricious. No, but they are, they are different kinds of architects and they chose normally, I would say, what, what pleased them. So I don't know how you can give grades in this way, because you, if you are a minimalist, you would not like Rococo probably. And if you have uh, Rococo tendencies, you wouldn't like minimalism. So I think the, the evaluations in architecture are not just objective. In fact, I, I would say many times they are subjective, at least to an extent. So I don't know how professor can give grades so easily. You know, it's, it's, it's really a very subjective uh, enterprise. But if you do something like this today in a school of architecture here, you would be considered mad. But, you know, again, why a straight white wall is better than what we see here? Okay, I ended the, the, about the, the rather short presentation about Dominicus um, um, with a question mark. And now, we go to uh, Lotte Stam Bess, 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 I don't know very well how to pronounce her name. And please allow me to, to read uh, her biography because I think she had a very interesting life. And just a second, um, I think she deserves um, uh, attention mainly because of her very, very uh, vivacious, vivacious, vivacious life. So Charlotte Ida Anna Lotte Stambis Bessem was a German Dutch architect and urban planner who helped with, with the reconstruction of Rotterdam after World War II. You know, Rotterdam was bombed heavily during the Second World War. And we'll talk about Rotterdam more tomorrow when we talk about Rem Kolhas, who is uh, actually located there. Uh, okay, so. She was born in this uh, in Silesia in Germany, and uh, uh, as a young adult, she first found work as a weaver in Dresden, and this is very nice. 
I like weavers and I like weaving and I even have a presentation called architecture and weaving because the very word architecture springs etymologically from the root, linguistic root, tex, T-E-K-S, which means to weave. The second part of the word derives from, um, from uh, text in, in Sanskrit, T-E-K-S. And I could send you a diagram with all the um, linguistic uh, ramifications. This is very interesting. It means the act of weaving was the primordial architectural act. And that is exactly what Gottfried Zemper thought. The first architectural gesture was to weave. And uh, this, this has great, uh, great uh, consequences in architecture. But we've, we kind of forgot this. I even thought we could change the name of the architect instead of architect to be um, uh, tect arc, to put the second half of the word in front of the first one, tect arc or tect arch, instead of, in other words, to, em to emphasize the importance of text, the importance of text, text textile, the importance of weaving. Anyway, be before beginning her career as an architect, uh, she was a successful photographer, and we'll, we are going to see some photographs of her. Though she only worked with the medium professionally for a short period from 1926 to 1928, her work had a disproportionate impact and is now held in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Arthur Sackler Museum and Paul Getty Museum. From 1926 to 1928, she attended the Bauhaus School in Dessau. In the, in the next years of the interwar period, she worked in, in an office in, in offices in Berlin, Moscow, Ukraine, Brno, and Amsterdam. From 1946 to 1968, she worked as an urban planning architect and later as chief architect for the Agency for Earth, Urban Development and Reconstruction of Rotterdam, which had been heavily bombed in 1940 during the Second World War. In 1926, she attended the Bauhaus School, where she studied with Joseph Albers, Vasily Kandinsky, Jules Schmidt, and Günther Stölzel. Stölzel. Günther Stölzel, Stölzel, I will make a short presentation about her too uh, today. She was running the textile uh, department at the Bauhaus. She enrolled to study the more so-called feminine subject of weaving, but later she got accepted into an architecture course from Hans Meyer. You see on the right uh, portrait of Hans Meyer. At that time, he was the director of Bauhaus. The Bauhaus has three directors or directors. The first one was Walter Gropius, the second one was the man you see here, Hans Meyer. And the third one was Miss van der Rohe. Miss van der Rohe was the last one for the last three years. And then the school uh, dismantled. Uh, so she was accepted in his department. Now, maybe also because he liked her, you'll see they had an affair. So compared to his predecessor, Meyer was less prejudiced about the idea of women studying subjects that were dominated by and previously reserved for men. Bees was a good student, but Meyer was not convinced of her future prospects unless she would marry a male architect and work for his firm. Incredible discrimination. Anyway, Meyer, Bauhaus director and a married man with two children, and Bees started a love affair. Despite the school's liberal climate, the affair was not approved of, and in December 1928, Meyer suggested Bees to leave Bauhaus, which he did. In 1928, Hans Meyer, uh, Hans Meyer hired Bees at his office in Berlin, so I guess he couldn't live without her, but she was dissatisfied. He then tried to find Bees another job through his network in vain. She was turned down by Walter Trullo because, as indicated in a letter to his friend, he did, not, he did not like working with women. Later, she followed him to Moscow. So the, the woman we are paying homage to now followed Hans Meyer to Moscow, 
where she also met Marv Stamm, whom she would later marry. Although reuniting with Meyer, the man in the picture, had not been a success, she had become pregnant. She moved back to Brno to continue her work at uh, Bohuslav Fuchs architecture firm and gave birth in Brno to her son, Peter, or Peter. Vese took Fox to court because he, as correspondence with a lawyer reveals, refused to pay the necessary allow allowance for the three months maternity leave that he had, he had offered. She did not return to his firm and given her status as a single mother and the de deepening economic crisis, she struggled, struggled to find new work in Brno. Later, she left to Ukraine and ran into her former Bauhaus lecture, lecturer and Dutch architect, Mart Stamp, with whom she started a love affair. <laughs> Due to difficulties that were arising from the changing climate of the USSR, Stam and Bees decided to marry before moving to the Netherlands in 1934. In Amsterdam, the couple set up their own firm, Stam and Bees architect, and, architect and, and in 1935, they had a daughter, Ariane. Because of her de early departure at the Bauhaus, she never received a diploma. This made it harder for her to become an architect in the Netherlands due to the union's pressure to the association of Dutch architects to dismiss non-graduates from the professional world before the end of the year in 1940. That year at age 37, she got admitted to start a degree in architecture at this school in Amsterdam due to her unique prior experience. The combination of her studies and the care for two children added pressure on her marriage with Stam. In 1943, they divorced after Stam committed adultery. However, Lotte Stam B decided to keep his name because the affiliation with his last name could give her a head start as an independent female architect in the Netherlands. She graduated in 1945. Now, then she worked at the Agency of Urban Development and Reconstruction of Rotterdam. She was one of the few women who made a huge contribution to the reconstruction, designing in a function, functionally style and influenced by the planning ideologies of the Siam Association. These worked on several social housing districts around the city, including Kleinenpolder, Pendrecht, Westbund, whatever. Uh, anyway, urban planning concepts. She uh, included the neighborhood concept and cluster in her plan for Pendrecht, which is considered to be her most significant architectural contribution. The neighborhood concept referred to the neighborhood as a self-supporting geographical unit, a city within a city with a social structure and community reminiscent of that of a village. During the post-war reconstruction, the neighborhood idea became a widely employed model for the creation of communities and the harmonious ordering of society. The cluster was a form of spatial organization with a physical and social connection between each home and the neighborhood as a whole. This introduced a small scale unit, the stamp, uh, to represent a microcosm of the larger community. The design of each stamp was tailored to the needs of different categories of residents, such as families, single dwellers, and elderly. The spatial arrangement of the freestanding blocks of different heights also reflected the so social diversity. Shopping centers, schools, and churches of different denominations were divided over the neighborhoods with some traffic-free streets in between. Buildings were separated by communal gardens and strips of greenery with a hope that residents of these different stamps would meet and interact in the open spaces. The diversity of residents in a small scale district would be representative of an open democratic society with a close knit neighborhood quality. However, in the following decades, the idea of the neighborhood unit had been abandoned and large parts of Pendrecht were modified or torn down. And now I will show you um, some images that I, I prepared uh, for this presentation. Uh, just a second. 
uh, where is here the Dominicus? Because I have too many. I was um, uh, what is going on here? Ah, it's this one. Okay. So she had a very, as you <laughs> you heard, a very rich and adventurous life. She lived until she reached 85. So uh, she was a German architect and urban planner, as you already know, who helped with the reconstruction of Rotterdam after World War II. And now we'll see some of his photographs, her photographs, which I think are excellent because they are, they, they are about the duality of life, you know, is the so-called real and the so-called the fantastic or unreal. And I do think, yes, life has both sides. And, uh, you know, she worked with double exposures. And I, I think she did a good job, you know, to, to unite order with disorder, clarity with uh, confusion or lack of clarity. I think she was very intelligent and, and, uh, and skillful. Uh, and uh, somehow I think she was able to, to, to unite the opposites, if I can, if I can say so. This is a picture with some of her, her colleagues at the Bauhaus. There she is with a, with a short um, haircut. And, um, you know, it, it's a little picture, but I think, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very skillfully done. And, um, well, she's surrounded by boys. It means they like her and she probably liked them. Anyway, there are, I see there are five boys around her, <laughs> and, but she seems to be indifferent to all of them. Anyway, uh, here she is with a T-square and a, a triangle at the, at the drafting board. And I don't know what that man behind her is doing. He's probably, uh, you know, fooling around, so to speak, you know, for the picture, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I love the Bauhaus and I could make a presentation about the Bauhaus continuously for you even now. So this is the Hans, this is Hans Meyer, the second director of the Bauhaus who fell in love with her and she fell in love with him and they had a child while he was also married and had two, two children. Anyway, <laughs> probably at that time when he's uh, rather smiling, he didn't yet have the troubles that probably arrived not much later. Here she is with a baby, with a first maybe baby anyway. Um, and uh, here is another picture of her. Uh, she was probably a fascinating woman, intense and creative and, uh, you know, uh, unafraid to take risks. Here she is an, as an older lady in front of an apartment building that, that she helped uh, come into being. Again, here she is as an urbanist. Uh, you know, she lived for a few years in, 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 in the Soviet Union. And it was a time when many Westerners went to Soviet Union because they were seduced by the idea of a new society for a new human being, you know, that was not... Uh, um, you know, crippled by uh, the mercantilism of, uh, of uh, capitalism. And uh, I, I, it was a genuine um, appreciation for what uh, they dreamt, um, you know, socialism or communism could have been. Uh, they also admired the, the, the avant-garde art of the, 20, or the beginning of the 20th century that, that happened uh, there. So, um, yeah, she spent some time there and, and trying to, 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 as she put it, to, to create order out of chaos and to bring some of the, the urbanistic principles she learned while she studied in Germany uh, to, to Russia. Or no, sorry, to Soviet Union. So now we see some, uh, some of the urban uh, schemes that she designed or planned. You know, is the typical, uh, yes, um, you know, uh, left wing or democratic or socialist or communist kind of planning, very luminous for, uh, you know, what was supposed to be equal human beings. I lived in communism. I know some of this form of um, urbanism. And uh, at that time, I kind of protested because it was too much uniformity, although here, there isn't just, uh, there is order, but there is also variety. 
I think. And um, to be honest with you, I miss working at that time, you know, when you had, I don't know, I, I, I am, uh, I am, uh, um, I am not so seduced by capitalism, to be honest with you. I was not seduced by communism either, because I knew it firsthand and I knew its problems. Theoretically, I agreed with it, but the way it was practiced, I didn't. But is the ideology of making a profit better? I, I, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, so another project by her, this was done and this was done in, in the Soviet Union. And um, there was a there was a time of idealism, you know, uh, you know, and I think it's very rewarding for an architect or an urbanist or for an artist to work for the for the people, you know, for those sometimes for those underprivileged, I think it's hard to be uh, feel accomplished ignoring those who are less privileged. Um, anyway, some of these uh, had, had been built and, uh, you know, uh, it's very possible, you know, that they still stand the, 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 the test of time. You know, it's, it's, it's something about this architecture that appears to be, you know, uh, devoid of the, um, you know, the variety of a very free architecture, but I, I could look at it differently. It's, it, it's a form of a more harmonious kind of planning and, and it expresses uh, the, the, the equality of the inhabitants, which is, um, which is not a little thing, I think. Anyway, um, yes, intellectuals at that time and artists, they did believe in, in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the ethics and the aesthetics of a new society, of a new man. Um, and some of the most important Western artists were very happy to offer the, you know, the, the works uh, either in exhibitions or whatever in Soviet Union. Uh, I remember when I uh, reading that when Picasso had his first exhibition in, in Moscow, I think, in, or St. Petersburg, I think in Moscow, there was a large crowd waiting for the, uh, the opening and the artist was there, but he was late at the opening of his own exhibition. And when he arrived, he said to them, you know, please forgive me. I know it, it, it was hard waiting. But what does it matter really half an hour or an hour? I don't know for how long he was late when you waited for, I don't know how many years to see my works. So anyway, um, he, he was even a communist and so was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Of course, they were communists with, uh, in the case of Picasso with a castle, at least a castle, if not more castles and very rich, but he, you know, his mental uh, attitude was that of uh, being on the side of of of, uh, of the left. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I I I I myself kind of miss doing ur urbanist, uh, you know, urban urban works for uh, for a different kind of society, not a society that is obsessed with. Uh, you know, consume and uh, with the ideology of making a profit and all the rest. Uh, who knows? I, I shouldn't idealize now that the other side because I know about it as well. Anyway, um, so this is this interesting person who, plus I wanted to say something else. Uh, the male architect doesn't have to go through the troubles that a, a female architect does, you know. If she has children, you see, she has to take care of the children. It's a different story altogether. Uh, women have to make more sacrifices than the men. You know, the men might have to sacrifice not watching a soccer game, but the woman has to, she, she's the, the, the central force within a family. She's, she's uh, you know, giving milk to the children. She, she's giving birth to the children and she also creates architecture, art, photography, urbanism. And um, 
yeah, here are, there are some uh, well-known uh, blocks of flats that, uh, you know, uh, uh, socialist country had and has still. Um, I live myself in such buildings. Here she is older in, uh, in uh, now you see her urbanism is a little bit changed in Rotterdam after the war, but I, I, I still think, you see, she's smoking. <laughs> she's smoking while presenting her work. Um, nice. We don't see easily such scenes any longer. Uh, not that I miss necessarily, you know, smoking myself or seeing somebody else smoke, but it's, 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 it's a different time. At that time, nobody was afraid or, or, or even bothered if someone smoked. Now it's not like this especially in the United States. Um, uh, here is a picture with her, you know, uh, young. I don't know if she took it herself uh, or not. Okay, so this was the short presentation. Uh, uh, she probably deserves a larger one, maybe next year. But I can show you, since I don't like to disappoint my, my audience, I will show you what I promised. I can show you a very short presentation about Günther Stolz, who was her master, so to speak, in the weaving department at the Bauhaus, a very interesting uh, artist as well, also uh, a woman. Uh, and uh, she was the only woman master or lady master at the Bauhaus, just as uh, the architect we talked about uh, before, who was the first female student in the architecture department. Günther Stölzl was the, the only must, you know, feminine presence between the masters. She ran the, the, the weaving department. And uh, here she is. Uh, and I'm sure she was very appreciated. You know, it, it was still a school. There were female students in the school, but was still you know, founded by a man, that's Walter Gropius, and all the other professors were, were males. She was the only one who arrived at that position to, to run a department. Here she is in her older age, uh, Günther Stölzl, and I, I, I love the art of weaving. Uh, here are some of her uh, tapestries or woven work. Uh, so, as you remember, uh, um, you know, uh, the person we celebrate today, she studied initially weaving, and that's why initially she wanted to enter the more so-called feminine side of or department of the Bauhaus. That's what that's what Günther Stölzl was doing, and uh, you will see another important uh, Bauhaus uh, uh, pr feminine presence, uh, Albers who also did uh, tapestries uh, later on. But these are done by Günther Stölzl. I never, I didn't find uh, uh, examples of other, um, you know, tapestries done in the school, except hers and uh, um, Albert's. It was a very special school, really, um, the Bauhaus. Um, but since I like to give bonuses, so to speak, you'll also see some tapestries done by Le Corbusier. I don't know if you know, but he also did tapestries. Well, he didn't move them themselves, himself, but he did the designs and they were done, they were realized. Um, on the other hand, I invite you to, to reflect on a more feminine kind of uh, architecture. What would that be? How would it be? Here is a picture on the roof of the Bauhaus from left to right. Uh, Marcel Breuer, then Günther Stölzl, then Oskar Schlemmer, then Vasily Kandinsky, and then standing up, Walter Gropius, the founder. And I don't know about the other two, why they only see the shoes. But I, uh, anyway, and here is uh, here they are, all of them, but in a different uh, positioning. I will not... Uh, uh, the one with uh, that strange uh, kind of communistic uh, cap or hat on his head, uh, well, the one on the right is uh, Laszlo Moholinog, who ran uh, the Chicago or the new Bauhaus in Chicago. 
I see there were two other men. I do not know who they are. Well, the one here, Günther Stolzl, uh, with, a, with a hat, is uh, Oskar Schlemmer. And on his right, uh, again, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, the great uh, Russian prince and abstract expressionist. And then sitting on the back of the bench, the young, uh, uh, very talented Marcel Breuer. Okay, this is the office of Walter Gropius with some tapestry or oven works by Günther Stözel. So obviously she was very appreciated if, uh, you know, she was commissioned, so to speak, or did the works that adorned. You see, even this room, this room, this very room of the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, had ornaments because what else are these? What is the rug and what is the tapestry on the wall? So you see, Walter Gropius needed something to, you know, bring color in and warmth to his otherwise white walls. Okay, now some Le Corbusier, some tapestries by Le Corbusier, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, Le Corbusier didn't say no to this form of art, and uh, and. Um, you know, uh, they are, they are, I think they are very, very convincing and interesting. Now this, this, this is displayed in the, in the, in the large room of the Palace of Justice in Chandigarh. Sorry for the resolution of this uh, photograph. The master looking uh, <laughs> looking towards us, and here is uh, his, um, you know, uh, oven oven signature. And um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, tapestries should come back into our lives, and oven work, and more than this, perhaps the conception of architecture as an act of weaving, uh, deriving its very name from text, T-E-K-S, from the Sanskrit, the oldest uh, etymological root um, for the word architect. All the words architect in all languages derive from that root, linguistic root, meaning text, meaning to weave. And well, I said this, I, maybe I shouldn't repeat now, you know, with this conception that the first architectural gesture was uh, related to weaving, and it was actually about weaving, was formulated clearly by Gottfried Zemper, who said, and I, I, I'll, I'll put it very quickly, uh, the first house that came into being was when some fishermen and, and, and huntermen uh, gathered around the fire. They didn't yet have a house, but they understood they had to protect the fire and how to protect it quickly. They didn't have tools to cut down trees and make the structure. So they, they just took some plants, some vegetable material from bushes, whatever they found around it. And they, through weaving, through weaving, they created these panels and protecting the fire with a vertical, uh, you know, vertically placed uh, panels around the fire. So he thought that weaving was the first architectural gesture. And it's a very interesting conception. And I believe he was closer to, to truth. And it's not an accident that the oldest etymological root for all the words deriving uh, or connected with architecture is text, T-E-K-S, which means to weave. Uh, and uh, I think this is very interesting. To put it in a different way, because all the goddesses of weaving were all female, they were all women. So I would say that actually the feminine presence in the word architecture and in what architecture means 
is actually feminine, it's not masculine, because it has to do with weaving. But the structuralist doesn't think in this way. Anyway, uh, Le Corbusier, tapis, Tapisserie, on L'Eglise du Chateau for Le Tancreuse, it was an exhibition with his tapestries. And here is the master <laughs> contemplating, or I don't know what he's doing there with, with some of his works, uh, which became uh, tapestries, uh, this uh, Le Corbusier oeuvre tissé, you know, meaning uh, oven, oven oeuvre, oven work. And uh, other exhibition, tapisserie uh, récent de Le Corbusier. We don't very often talk about this dimension, this side of Le Corbusier, that he also created uh, tapestries, but I think it's important. Anyway, uh, thank you. I could continue the other things. Let me see who is here now. Uh, hello, Michael. Uh, short presentation uh, about the Bauhaus. Uh, Bauhaus, okay, from here. And we go to slideshow from the beginning. So it lasted for only 14 years, from 1919 to 1933. Uh, here is a picture with the masters, with those who led um, the departments, most of them, as you can see, the only lady there, and the only one who took her hat off was the lady, none of the gentlemen. This also says something about the world at that time, and also about world, the, 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 the world in general, you know. How come no male took his hat off? Only the lady did so. Well, it's also true. She probably also had the nicest hair uh, while the other man. Yeah, I'm sorry. That you haven't shown the, the screen. Uh, so we cannot see the slides. Uh, sorry. <laughs> thank you for I'm sorry. Very, thank you for letting me know. Yes, sometimes this is what happens. Yeah, so just a second, share screen. Uh, okay, thank you very much for for, <laughs> for letting me know. Okay, uh, now you see it, right? Hello? Yes, 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 perfect. Okay, okay you see it. So Bauhaus, 1919, 1933. Uh, so last year, there were 100 years since the Bauhaus was, uh, was founded. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the picture I was talking about where the, the only female is uh, the only one who took her hat off and all the males didn't. <laughs> What can we do? Still a, a male-centered world, and uh, the men didn't feel like, uh, you know, uh, taking their hats off. But the lady knew better. She was more sensitive and res respectful. Uh, so, but there are here incredible artists. Here is uh, Lionel Feininger, the only uh, uh, American uh, professor at the Bauhaus. Here, the great poet of, of painting, Paul Klee. Here, another great, great, great painter, Vasily Kandinsky. In the back here, the young Marcel Breuer. In the front here, the, the leader, uh, Walter Gropius, who couldn't draw. He always employed the services of another architect because he couldn't draw. Uh, I don't know who this, uh, these two gentlemen are, but this is Moholinog, and uh, that's about it. One of them is Makie, and um, anyway. They are on the roof of the Bauhaus. And here is another picture which we saw earlier. Uh, and uh, it must have been a brilliant school just to know that your colleagues are some of the best artists in the world. What is also interesting is that this school didn't uh, have uh, architects teaching there, except, well, Breuer became an architect, but initially he worked, uh, you know, in the furniture, you know, division or department of the school, and then miss at the end when he was hired to lead the school. But otherwise, there were no architects, with the exception of Walter Gropius, who himself didn't have a diploma, but he was uh, considered the architect. This is a picture with uh, Vasily Kandinsky on the left and Nina Kandinsky, his wife. And I always have trouble is Maki or Muche, uh, I think he was a sculptor, and, and uh, Paul Klee and uh, Walter Gropius. 
uh, at the Bauhaus. This was the, the you know the the ideogram, the logo of the of the school that was um, designed by Oskar Schlemmer. And this is the a very very interesting thing. And usually this is either forgotten or not known. But initially the Bauhaus was a mystical school. I don't think I exaggerate too much by using the word mystical. In this very short manifesto, Gropius uses twice the words heaven, the word heaven, and the last word of the manifesto is faith. And look at the graphic representation of the manifesto. They called it the Cathedral of Socialism and it was done by Lionel Feininger. So, you know, usually we think of the Bauhaus as being a kind of an international style, functionally school. Well, it kind of became that, but at the beginning it was something very different. And this was the, the building in Weimar that was designed by uh, Van der Velde, Henry Van der Velde. Uh, and uh, then it moved after a few years five, six years to Dessau, where Gropius designed the new buildings. Vasily Kandinsky, ah, you know, my heart beats quicker because I would have loved to have such colleagues and friends. You know, can try to imagine that in your school, Vasily Kandinsky taught, you know. Uh, it's incredible how, how creative and open-minded the school was. You know, and it was because of the personalities that Gropius had the inspiration to hire. You know, and uh, um, I can only imagine what you do in such a climate, you know, of, of experimentation and, you know, uh, having great artists as your teachers. Now, what is even more amazing is that this school also produced some important architects and they didn't actually have teachers, architects. Hans Meyer was an architect, but very socially oriented. I mean, he was more like a social worker in the field of architecture. And then Miss van der Rohe for three years. And then the, the school, um, you know, was dismantled and, and they, some of them left Europe for the United States. Moholy Nogi, he, he was initially a lawyer and then uh, he became an artist with photographic art and uh, kinetic sculptures. And then in Chicago, he, he was the, the director of the new Bauhaus in Chicago. So after the Bauhaus in Dessau was dismantled, this is one of his, uh, you know, sculptures. Um, and the photograph, he was, he was very good at both uh, and uh, an interesting man, but he died rather young which is sad. Um, and uh, Lionel Feininger, who did that engraving uh, that accompanied the text, the short text by, uh, by Walter Gropius, uh, representing the Cathedral of Socialism, some paintings by Feininger. He was uh, American, but with, uh, you know, some ancestry from, from Germany. Um, he was the only American that taught in the first phase at the beginning, uh, the beginning of the Bauhaus. Oscar Schlemmer, I love Oscar Schlemmer. He did, he was the uh, choreograph. He did uh, graphic arts. He, he was very, very inventive. Unfortunately, he also died uh, rather young, but he was very important for the Bauhaus and he created the logos of the Bauhaus. But his uh, choreography is still very much, uh, I would say, contemporary, you know, and uh, even now some of, of, of the works he, he created are, are uh, reenacted. Literally, the Bauhaus was about the unity of all arts. And Gropius said in that short manifesto, that the craftsman and the architect, or the craftsman and the artist, they are both craftsmen. They all uh, find their foundation, their base into a craft. The only difference between the artist and the craftsman, said Gropius in that short manifesto that you saw, is that, that the artist is an exalted craftsman. Otherwise, they are both craftsmen, but the artist is exalted. 
that exaltation is very, very important. Equally important, of course, is craft. You need craft, but you also need exaltation. And I don't think too many schools of architecture cultivate exaltation. Maybe some cultivate uh, craft, but I'm not sure too many encourage or even use the word exaltation. Paul Klee, I love Paul Klee. He died at 60, but he was a great poet of painting. And uh, Miss van der Rohe in his apartment in Chicago had little paintings. His paintings are not large. In a way, he's the very opposite of Picasso. Uh, he had very small uh, artworks, Miss van der Rohe in his apartment in, uh, in uh, Chicago. And obviously, uh, Miss appreciated uh, the art of Paul Klee a lot. And with good reasons, because he was a great painter and a great thinker. And you can find, I think, on Arch Daily, his note no, notebooks uh, for his um, classes at the Bauhaus. Very creative, almost kind of like a, a new age or not new age in, in the sense of in which we use the words today, but like a modern Leonardo. He loved cats too. He had a number of cats. Uh, and uh, Hans Meyer. Hans Meyer was the you know, you know of him now because he had a, um, a son with a, with a lady we celebrated today. Uh, and he was, he was a communist. And uh, in fact, that was, he, that, that's what he was accused of and then dismissed after, I don't know, about three years uh, being the director of, of the school. He was a functionalist. He was a communist. But he also had idealism. I read today that, for example, when he was in Russia, he refused to receive a bonus that the government of the Soviet Union was giving to foreigners who worked in, uh, in, in, in Soviet Union. He wanted to be equal with, uh, with uh, common you know, uh, Soviet workers. And, and I like this very much. You know, How many people would do something like this today? Not too many, and I think his architecture is also kind of interesting. You know, yes, it's 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 the opposite of expressionism. It's the opposite, but maybe there is even here some form of uh, so societal uh, mysticism, if I can express myself in this way. Anyway, uh, so this is Hans Meyer, who was the second director of the of the Bauhaus. And he was the director until 1930 when Miss came, or 1931. I know Miss ran the school for three years. He didn't like Hans Meyer. And I would understand why this was the project for the palace of the Soviets in uh, Soviet Union that uh, Hans Meyer did, but he didn't win. And, um, but something was built on his, uh, on, on this, this was a building uh, based on his design. Now, Günther Stölzl, the, the remarkable woman who took her hat off in that photograph and who ran the, the, the department of tapestries, and you already saw some of these works, even this one, uh, I will not uh, insist. Uh, you know of her, and it's important that we remember her name. Uh, and um, Herbert Bayer, he was uh, the man uh, specialist of... Uh, graphic arts and publicity or media arts, you know, uh, he immigrated also to the United States and he was involved with the Aspen uh, in Aspen, in Colorado with, uh, he did many things in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the United States. Yes, I would be very happy to know that once the pandemic is, is somehow controlled or, 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 or it vanishes or something, we find a solution to it. If Europe can rejuvenate itself by creating, recreating the spirit of the Bauhaus, it would be great, uh, I think. I would love to become myself involved. I always had for a good number of years the idea to start the Bauhaus East, called Bauhaus East School, because I think that uh, uh, orientation towards East, East is kind of forgotten and is about the spiritual side of the Bauhaus. 
without forgetting the other elements, of course, functionalism and so on, uh, the, the unity with technology, that would be fine. But I wouldn't neglect also the other side, meaning the, the, the spiritual, even metaphysical side of the Bauhaus. Anyway, I'm not, I, I'm not very skillful in, the, in public relations and I don't have the money, but I, I would gladly contribute to, to a new Bauhaus. Johannes Eaton, he was the mystic and he was dismissed or he resigned because of a conflict with Gropius. I pre made a presentation about him a few days ago. He even looks like a, <laughs> a Mazda's nun monk or something. Uh, he was also teaching the theory of colors. He was Swiss. And um, as I said, he was, uh, you know, after uh, three years, I think he entered into a conflict with Gropius and either he left or he was <laughs> forced to leave. This was a strange drawing by him called the house of the white man, uh, which to me is not uh, a compliment. The house doesn't seem to be so glorious from an architectural point of view. But he had his own uh, ideology. He was even accused uh, because he was influenced by influenced by this strange theory uh, related to eugenics called Mazda's Nun, and he even organized that. At, uh, I think I will arrive at some pictures uh, relating to the Ma Mazda's Nun uh, parties that they had at, at, at the Bauhaus. Walter Gropius, the founder. And this is the, the school that he designed uh, in De Dessau. The initial one, initial one in Weimar you saw was built by uh, uh, Henry van der Velde, but this one was uh, built by, um, by Gropius. But here you see a monument in an expressionist mode. So initially Gropius was animated by, uh, by that very uh, exaltation uh, uh, that he thought was important for an artist and would differentiate him from the craftsman. Um, earlier works before the Bauhaus that Gropius did uh, in conjunction with another architect, I think Adolf Meyer, he, he never worked alone because he this one of the masters of the modern movement, he didn't draw. And this is the Panam building in New York, which also was built by him. And now it's called, um, I don't know if it's still called MetLife. Initially it was the Panam uh, building. And this is a, a block of flats in Berlin uh, built in the 50s. And in the proximity of this building, you'll see buildings by Alvar Alto, Bakema, even Oscar Niemeyer is, uh, uh, if you travel to Berlin, I suggest you see this, uh, cluster of very important, um, you know, buildings, social housings, most of them. Miss, Miss van der Rohe, Miss who changed his name because his first name here, Miss, is actually his last name, is, is actually his family name, but he changed his name and Rohe was his mother's name. He changed his name and he added van der because uh, the Germans didn't allow him to say Miss van Rohe as he would have like Miss Der Roche, he wanted his name to sound like that of an aristocrat, which he was not. He was not an aristocrat. He had humble, uh, uh, you know, beginnings. So then he settled for the Dutch form, Van Der Roche. But Miss in German means lousy. So it's kind of interesting in a, you know, translating very poetically or, or, uh, superficially, but with a certain amount of truth, his name would be the lousy aristocrat or the lousy the Roche. Anyway, initially he was himself an expressionist, a monument for Rosa Luxemburg, you know, in brick. Can you believe it, miss? And this is a project done uh, also before he left Germany. Look at it, you know, it's, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, an imperial architecture, really. And this is a skyscraper he proposed for Berlin, which was not built. And uh, that's sad. It could have been a very interesting building, but he built a Seagram building in New York once he arrived in New York. And uh, the, the working drawings were signed by Philip Johnson because he didn't have the right to sign. Uh, well, he never had a diploma in architecture and he didn't have the right to sign architectural works 
in the United States. I don't know how he did it later on, and he built a lot, especially in Chicago. Anyway, um, once I proposed myself for a competition, a little meditation chapel right in front of this building in the center of that plaza. But I, I, I might have somewhere a picture of it, but I don't know where. Anyway, and this is the great uh, Crown Hall in Chicago where the, the School of Architecture is. And um, yes, one of, one of his um, remarkable buildings uh, in Chicago. Uh, not far away from it is the subway station that uh, Rem Kolhas uh, designed and uh, it, tomorrow it will be his birthday, I repeat. And tomorrow I invite you at the same hour to talk about uh, Rem Kolhas. Okay, Marcel Breuer, who also uh, activated his architectural uh, powers in the United States, but initially he worked for the furniture department at the Bauhaus the famous uh, Kandinsky chair uh, or Vasily chair. Um, and um, yeah, uh, this is a house he built in the States. Uh, the Whitney Museum of Art in New York also built by Marcel Breuer, consider, I don't know if totally correctly, a brutalist architectural work. I, I think the word is a little too brutal for this work. This is for UNESCO uh, in Paris, uh, where he worked with Pierluigi Nervi and uh, uh, French architect Christian Zephos. I think uh, this is maybe the work of Nervi or in conjunction with uh, Marcel Breuer, I don't know, in Paris. In Paris, where also Tadao Ando has a little chapel, uh, meditation ch uh, chapel or place, a cylinder, uh, very nice, near this building. Gerhard Marx, with him I have problems even to, um, I guess it's not difficult to pronounce his name. He was a sculptor uh, and uh, what a beautiful conjunction of talents, you know, and when such brilliant people come together, wonders happen. And yes, it was the genius of Walter Gropius that he invited them, he kept them together. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, beautiful things happen when, when uh, Artists have a certain degree of legitimacy and of, uh, of power even, uh, you know, and, and they had because they were together, they, they were united, uh, they were also intellectuals, you know, they were not those uh, artists who cannot uh, uh, whisper a word, no, they, they were intelligent uh, people who were able to paint, but also to think and to write and to draw and so on. Okay. Um, Joseph Albers, maybe you know because I mentioned uh, this uh, not too long ago, uh, Joseph Albers uh, in connection with Tadao Ando. Tadao Ando said at the, uh, at the beginning of his um, career in architecture that he wanted to do an architecture that was inside like Piranesi and outside like Albers, like Joseph Albers. You will see the difference that Joseph Albers is very Apollonian or Apollonic you know, uh, peaceful, harmonious, uh, uh, nothing extravagant or disturbing. And Piranesi was the, the volcano. So I guess what Adao Ando wanted to say is that he wanted an architecture that inside was tumultuous and outside was serene and luminous, like Albert's uh, paintings. And you will see also the works of his wife, who was uh, doing tapestries. Uh, and um, yes, Annie Albers. Annie Albers was uh, in the department of uh, tapestries and you see some of her works. Uh, uh, she worked with the Gunta Stelzel and she studied with her. And you see her tapestries are different from Gunta Stelzel. Here she is. It's something I don't know. I, I love weaving. I don't know anything about weaving. I couldn't weave, but the idea of weaving I like. Uh, it's the feminization of art in a way. And, and weaving is very important. Uh, okay, so the new, the new Bauhaus in Chicago, so after the Bauhaus was dismantled, the school was opened in uh, Ulm in Germany, but the, but the more important one is in Chicago, which was run by uh, Laszlo Moholinogi. And you see here the, you know, the, 
the logo uh, you know in Chicago still based on on, on that profile that uh, Oscar Schlemmer uh, uh, designed so the Bauhaus in Ulm in Germany uh, you know uh, an announcement for it and then it even arrived in India there was for a short while uh, a branch of the Bauhaus in India and here you see a, a picture of this school and it, it just shows how how magnificently uh, blooming uh, a great spirit can uh, can be you know 13 14 years and then it went to the states and then it went to india and to ulm and, and we still talk about it bravo to them thank you very much i will stop now uh, although i could continue to talk but maybe it's better to stop at one point <laughs>